العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And welcome to this new episode of Women Around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Today, we will attempt to talk about two of our mothers, two great women whom the Prophet والسلام, lived with and impacted their lives profoundly. The first wife of the Prophet والسلام, is Juwayriya. بنت الحارث ابن أبي ضرار ابن المصطلق from the great tribe of خزاعه جويرية was not her original name as ibn Abbas may Allah be pleased with him and with his father said that her real name was برة and برة meant pious or righteous and it was a habit that the Prophet ﷺ would change most names that had self-praise to them. And he used to not like people saying he left righteous or pious when he leaves the house. Instead of saying he left Hind or he left Fatima, which is a normal name. Because it insinuates that he has left righteousness and piety. And this is why scholars say that it is not recommended to call or to name your daughter as Tuqa or Iman. So that when someone calls and says, is Iman there? And he says, no, there is no Iman. Meaning that it's a double edge, uh, a sword that can mean the person is not there, but also it can mean that there is no Iman. There is no Tuqa. There is nothing as such. So the Prophet used to change names, bad names into good names, names that imply praising one's self into normal names. So for example, he changed the name of Hazan. One of the companions' name was Hazan, which means difficult. And he said, no, your name is Sahl, easy. So he used to change such names, alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, we don't have a lot about the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And the books of Seerah only highlights what was important, what had an impact on the life of that mother of the believer or generally on Seerah itself and the life of the Prophet ﷺ and the lessons that can be learned from it. So what's the story with Juwayriya? Juwayriya was the daughter of Al-Harith ibn Abi Dirar and Bani al-Mustaliq. They were a tribe that assisted the idol worshippers, being themselves idol worshippers. They assisted the people of Quraysh in their battles, such as the Battle of Uhud, and they kept on intimidating the Muslims and expressing hostility towards Islam. So when the Prophet heard والسلام, that they were preparing their armies to attack the Muslims, the Prophet والسلام, had to take a preemptive measure and he went with the Muslims to attack them. And they took them by surprise, being the enemies of Islam, 
an open enemy. And there was a fight where men were killed, others fled, while the women and the children were taken as slaves and captive, captives of war. So Juwayriya bint al-Harith was given as part of the booty of war, the spoils of war, to one of the warriors. And he was Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas. May Allah be pleased with him. And Thabit himself has a history with the Prophet ﷺ because he was the orator. He was the spokesman of the Prophet ﷺ. Whenever tribes came and they met face to face, they would appoint someone to give a speech praising his tribe and their achievements. So he's known as the Khatib. So the Prophet ﷺ had Thabit as his spokesman due to his loud voice and due to his fluency and beautiful language. So she was appointed and given to him. Being who she was, a woman of great honor and social status, the daughter of a tribe's leader. So, so she was a princess and not a common woman. She could not live with the thought of being a slave. In Islam, there's an option for slavery. They can buy themselves out. A slave can go to his master and say, listen, I would like to buy myself out. How much would you like? And the guy would say, if I were to display you for sale, I would get maybe $1,000. So $1,000 is good for me. So the slave goes and work, depending on his expertise and knowledge, and gains the money and gives it to his master, and he's free to go. So she went to Thabit ibn Qais and she asked him for such a transaction and he agreed. But she was penniless. She had nothing, no money, no wealth. And her father fled and all the men in her tribe ran away with their lives. So she thought that the only alternative is to ask people to assist her. By that time, she had already accepted Islam. And this is logical and normal. Most people have resentment to Islam due to what they see in the media. And you can't blame them. The media brainwashes them. If they don't put some effort to research and read objectively on their own, they are like the rest of the herd. If the herd leader goes left, they all go left. Even if it's a cliff that they're going to fall off. They just follow the herd leader. So those who liberate themselves from the effect of unbiased, or bias, media, and research it, would find the truth. Juwaira was one of them. Yes, she was taken as a prisoner of war. Yes, she was enslaved. But when she saw Islam, and she realized that all what she was hearing from her father, from the other tribesmen about Islam was false, she accepted it. So she went to the Prophet ﷺ to seek his financial assistance. Mother Aisha narrates the hadith and she says that when she came seeking permission to speak with the Prophet ﷺ, the moment I set eyes on her, 
I hated it. This is what Mother Aisha is saying. She says she was beautiful, charming, and cute. Any man would set eyes on her would be captivated by her beauty. So she said, I did not like this. I hated it. She's a woman. She knows. So when she talked to the Prophet, she said, O Prophet of Allah, my name is Juwayriya bint al-Harith ibn Abi Dirar, the head of his tribe and their leader. And you have seen what had happened to me. And I was given to Thabit ibn Qais. So I bought myself from him and he agreed. So now I am here to seek your assistance in paying off my debt. So the Prophet ﷺ gave her a choice. So he said to her, would you like something that is better? Meaning that I can give you money to set yourself free. But would you like me to give you something which is a, an offer you cannot refuse? She said, what would that be, O Prophet of Allah? And the Prophet said, I'll pay off your debt and I'll marry you. Now, being who she was, the daughter of the leader of her tribe, the princess, and being the one proposing to her is the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the strongest man in Arabia, a messenger, a prophet from Allah. Who can come close to him? No one. So she immediately on the spot accepted this offer that no one can refuse. And she says, of course, O Prophet of Allah, I would take this offer. So the Prophet said, I have done that. Meaning that I've paid your dues and I married you. And the news came out to the people, to the companions that the Prophet والسلام, married Juwayriya bint al-Harith. So the people who were with the Prophet والسلام, who had prisoners of war under their control, which was money, they said, how is it possible that the Prophet's in-laws are enslaved with us? This is not befitting. We set all the captives under our control free for the sake of Allah and after that for the sake of the Prophet's new wife. Imagine how many people were set free. The narration says by setting Juwairiyas free and marrying her, she was the most influential she was the most favorable, or she had the favor and the blessing over her tribe. No woman could have done this to her own people. She got a hundred household, hundred families, all freed and set free from slavery because of her marriage to the Prophet ﷺ. What more blessing can there be? Now, people who do not have Iman, who do not believe, they would criticize and say, oh, the Prophet married her because she was beautiful and charming. As if it is an insult. When you as a human being want to eat something, would you eat trash? Or would you eat a beautiful and tasty meal? Would anyone condemn you if you were to drink something that is sweet and cold instead of taking something that is bitter or bad? Is the Prophet ﷺ a human being or not? He is a human being and he likes to eat 
to drink and he likes women. He himself told us about himself that from your world, Allah made beautiful to me women and perfumes. He loves to smell good things. So only the idol worshippers criticized the messengers of Allah long ago that they eat food and they walk in the markets. They're normal human beings. And this is insane. No one said that the prophets are not human beings. They are human beings. And the more they have this urge to natural things, the more perfect they are. It is totally wrong to think that being celibate is something positive or something natural. This is not natural. What is natural is what Allah has put in us, this attraction to the opposite gender, so that we can get married and we can reproduce. So the Prophet ﷺ was a perfect man with desires. But when you compare him to others, you will see that the difference between the heavens and the earth. He was extremely strong as a man, yet he was satisfied with a woman 15 years older than him from the age of 25 until the age of 50. Never ever had a second wife or anything of the sort. And then he married someone his age who was in her 50s, and was Saudah bin Zama. May Allah be pleased with her. And he stayed with her for three more years. We know that the companions used to talk and say that the Prophet ﷺ was given the power of 30 men. He's not like us. He's so strong, especially when it comes to issues of intimacy. He's the perfect man. Yet, with all his fasting, with all his night prayer, with all his obligations, which would normally wreck a normal person, the Prophet had the power of 30 men. So it is not shameful. It is not something that is bad to seek what is halal through marriage. And look at the consequence of such a choice. The Prophet would not let someone who's like Juwairiyah, who is a princess, to be given as a concubine to one of the companions. She would not be happy in her life. Her master would not be happy with her. And she may cause problems and trouble to him. She must be given to someone her equal or more superior so that she would be satisfied and fulfilled. And this is what happened when the Prophet married her, alayhi salatu salam, and her barakah and her blessing of such a marriage was cascaded to all of her people who were set free and they were all freed. How old was she? She was 20 years of age when the Prophet married her, alayhi salatu salam. How long did she live with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi salam? Not more than six years. And the Prophet died afterwards. And this is also important to pay attention to. Nowadays, girls and women fail to weigh things properly. And their parents as well. So if a person proposes to a girl, they look at the age difference. And said, no, 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 he's too old for her. Why? Because he's 10 years older or 15 years older. What's wrong in that? He said, no, this is a big gap. They sh it should be like three or four years difference. This is not realistic. A man at the moment graduates when he's 23 or 24 years from college. Then he joins the private sector or the workforce. He needs like three, four more years to collect money in order to open a house and get married. So by the time he's 28 years of age, 
which is the average, he will not look for someone who's 28 years of age or even 25 years of age. He would look for someone who's 17 or 16 or maximum 18. And if women and girls continue to refuse, they'll grow older and older and the proposals will get less and less. The demand is far less than the supply. For every man, there are like 15 or 20 women candidates. So she cannot pick and choose. He can pick and choose. I know a friend who's over 60 years of age, healthy, mashallah, and capable of getting married. He's trying to get married to anyone that accepts him. We proposed to women in their 40s. Imagine. And she says, no, 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 he's too old for, that, for me. He's not a patient that you will take care of. He's a healthy man. But still, these misconceptions ruin our lives. They hinder women from living their lives. What's wrong if you marry someone 60 or 65 years of age who's still fit and capable of earning? And all what you need is a husband. You're not going to be his nurse. What's wrong in that? The Prophet married her, alayhi salatu when he was 57 years of age. And she was 20 years of age. And she lived these six years with utmost happiness. Women don't think like this. And they keep on postponing and delaying until it is too late for them. So, Juwairiyah made the right choice. A choice of a lifetime. She became the mother of the believers. And she loved the Prophet والسلام, like all of his wives. Her father, Al Harith, came to the Prophet والسلام, after a while, after the marriage was done. So he said to him, in a truce, where he came and said, O Prophet of Allah, Juwairi is my daughter, and I am an honorable man. My daughter cannot fall into slavery. So ask whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. If you want a hundred camels, which is a real big fortune, I'll give it to you. So the Prophet said to him, how about I'll give you a better proposal? Keep your money and I'll give her the choice. If she chooses you, so be it. But if she chooses to stay with me, then you will honor that. And her father said, Wallah, you, you leave me no other choice than this beautiful and fair and just choice. So he goes to his daughter and he says to his daughter in a doubtful manner because he senses something fishy. And he says to her, Juwairiya, do not disgrace us, your family and tribe. The man has given you the choice. So what do you choose? Without any hesitation, she said, I choose the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. And her father said, by Allah, you've disgraced us. You choose this new man who killed your people, enslaved your families, and took you as a prisoner of war, as a slave woman, over me, your father? Of course, that would be the logical choice. Where would you find someone like the Prophet ﷺ to serve, let alone to get married to? So she made the right decision and she was one of the righteous practicing wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Muslim in the Sahih narrated 
that Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, said that Juwayra told him that once the Prophet ﷺ left her house to go and pray Fajr prayer, and she was in the place of her worship, where she prays her night prayer and Fajr, etc. So the Prophet went and came back like an hour and a half later when it was morning. And she was still where she was. So the Prophet asked her, are you still in the same position I left you? She said, yes, meaning a whole hour and a half. So she said, yes. So the Prophet said, alayhi salatu I said four words, four sentences that if they were to be weighed with all what you had said today, meaning this hour and a half, it would overweigh them. I said these four phrases three times. What were they? The Prophet said, Subhanallah wa bihamdih. Adad khalqih, as many as creations Allah has. Warida nafsih, as much as Allah is satisfied with. Wazina ta'arshih, as heavy as the throne is. Wamidada kalimatih, as much as the ink which Allah's words and commands are written by. So the Prophet ﷺ acknowledged her ibadah, her devotion to worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal, and he directed her to what is the best. Bukhari reported in his Sahih that the Prophet ﷺ came into Juwayriya's house on a Friday while she was fasting. So the Prophet asked her, did you fast yesterday? She said, no. Are you going to fast tomorrow? She said, no. The Prophet said to her, then break your fast, meaning that it is not permissible to isolate Friday with fasting unless you fast the day before and a day after. This was Juwayriyah, Bintul Harith, a beautiful name. Rarely you will find people calling their, wife, their uh, daughters Juwayriyah. One of my daughter's names is Juwayria. And I remember going to a hospital once and the receptionist was taking the information. So he says, what's the patient name? I said, Juwayria. And she said, Ju what? I said, Juwayria. And she's a Muslim. She said, why? What did she do wrong? You call her this name? <laughs> I said, Subhanallah, the mother of the believer, your mother, and you don't know her name? She said, I never heard this name before in my life. She's the wife of the Prophet? Ali Sosam said, yes. She said, I know only of Khadija and Aisha. That's it. And subhanAllah, about the ignorance we have. Juwayrah bint al-Harith, one of the mothers of the believers and one of the wives of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. And unfortunately, we don't have time to speak about the second one so that we would, inshaAllah, talk about her later on. هذا والله أعلم ونسبة العلم إليه أسلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam reminded us through his guidance and example that Islam is complete submission to the will of Allah. For one who submits a mere declaration or display of belief will not be taken for success, but his or her heart and soul will certainly be put to test. Allah tested the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam severely in order that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam becomes an example for his companions to follow. Similarly, he tests the believer to see whether he lives a righteous life in accordance with the instructions and commands set by Allah or lives according 
to what his desires dictate. Whether the faith he displays is firmly rooted in his heart or is it merely on the surface, he will be tested to see whether he will continue to have faith and love of Allah when in a calamity as he does when in comfort, whether he will continue to remember and worship him if given bounties and comforts of life as he does when he lives a modest life, Allah will undoubtedly test him to see if his faith, trust and love of him is unconditional or is it conditioned upon good health and a comfortable life free from stress and anxiety. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us through his own example that for a righteous Muslim, this life is a testing ground where he will continue to be tested until he meets Allah. For him, tests will be conducted on earth while he lives and not after he dies. He knows that as soon as death arrives and he steps into the next world, his tests are over. There, he only receives the result of his tests and enjoys the fruits of the deeds that he committed during a short span of time called life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back. Now we have a new system, alhamdulillah, that you can call free through Skype. And all what you have to do is type in the search box, ZAD, Z-A-D, space, TV, and you will get the contact. And you can call us, inshallah, uh, um, audio, of course, not video. And we will get you through if this works. So it's a new gadget that we've introduced. Let's hope that it works. Uh, Isa says, can we keep dog as a pet or for security reasons? As a pet, it is totally prohibited. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu was salam, uh, that angels do not enter a house where there's a portrait, a statue, or a dog. And he said that whoever keeps a dog other than a dog of uh, uh, a shepherd dog or a dog for hunting or guarding, then each day out of his own good deeds, Allah will erase and deduct the weight of Mount Uhud of good deeds, of Hasanat. A friend of mine, a relative actually, who has a chihuahua in his house. And so many times we tried, our relatives tried to give him advice and he said, oh, it's cute, it's lovely, it's this, it's that. So I said to him, listen, do you have enough good deeds every single day that would equal Mount Uhud in Hasanat? He said, not even one-tenth of that. I said to him, then in this case, you're in debt because every day this is being erased and deducted from your good deeds. And this, my friend, means that you're in real deep trouble. So this is not permissible. Now, for security reasons, this is permissible, providing that these reasons are legitimate. So again, keeping a chihuahua in your house is not for security reasons. It can be eaten by cat. So if you have a German Shepherd, a Doberman, something that is really vicious, and there is a need for it, that you are in a really disturbed environment or a neighborhood, that you fear for your life, and without that they will not be deterred from breaking into your house, this seems to be permissible, providing that you keep the dog outside the house and not allowing it to enter the house and Allah knows best. Aisha says, I feel worried for taking ruqya, water that has Quran. I feel worried taking it into the toilet and then 
putting it down the drain as I put it over myself. Is this allowed in Islam? I know regarding Quran in water and drinking it and washing yourself is good. But even if it goes down the drain in the toilet, the answer is yes. There's no problem, none whatsoever in taking water that has been recited ruqya on Quran, Ayat Kursi al-Fatiha, and then putting it on yourself, washing yourself, and it's going down the drain. There is nothing, even if it's zamzam water, there is nothing totally wrong in that, or this, there's no disrespect of the Quran in that, none whatsoever. Surayya says, is it permissible to make protection of car and blow it on our children or rub our hands on them after we do our adhkar as they can't do it themselves? Suraya, there is no reason to do this. I see a lot of people putting their hands on the heads of the children before they go to school and they recite Ayat al-Kursi and the three quls, etc., in different supplications, but I don't know any authentic hadith that backs it up. We know the hadith where the Prophet والسلام, used to say the ta'weeth, which is this statement. This is dua that the Prophet used to say to Al-Hasan and al Hussein, And he used to tell them that your great-great-grandfather, Ibrahim, peace be upon him, used to say this dua for his sons. So saying this dua is not needing to touch your children. But even if you put your hand over the heads or to their shoulders and you recite it, there's nothing wrong in that. However, if you would like to have protection, one of the best du'as found in Fortress of the Muslim, Husn al-Muslim, which the Prophet used to repeat والسلام, in the morning and evening adhkar. Beautiful du'a. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-afiyata fi dunya wal akhirah. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-afwa wal afiyah fi dini wa dunyaya wa ahli wa mali. And the dua continues. So the Prophet is asking Allah for al-afiyah, the well-being, the protection, health. In what? In my religion, in my world, over my family, and over my wealth. Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen says, may Allah have mercy on his soul, whoever says this in the morning and the evening, he would have got, gotten his children protected because they are included in ahli, my family. So this is better than going, touching their heads and repeating the duas. Just observe this every morning and every evening with the athkar that you say, and this would suffice you bi'idhnillahi azza wa jal. Fahim says, is hair transplant surgery permissible in Islam? There's a long discussion regarding this, but the most authentic opinion is that such a surgery is permissible where they tend to take some cells uh, or hairs from the back of the head, which is usually uh, um, the last affected by baldness, and then they transplant these in the skull or in, in the scalp itself, and it grows naturally. So this is to counter a defect and to remove something that is not normal. And there is nothing wrong in that. Cosmetic surgery is haram when it is only for the use of beautification or altering and changing the creation of Allah. But if it is to remove a defect or to fix something that is wrong or that impairs uh, uh, speaking or eating or movement, in this case, this is totally permissible and legitimate. Najib says, my sister borrows my headphones. Sometimes 
she watches movies. Other times, she has work meetings with it. Am I helping in sin? The default is that we do not judge people. So a headset or a headphone can be used in haram and it can be used in halal. Likewise, a knife. You can cut bread or meat with it and you can cut someone's throat or injure someone with it. So it depends on how it is being used. For you, Najib, if you're 100% certain that she will be using your headset for haram only, in this case, it is not permissible for you to give it to her because you would be assisting on evil. But if she is 50-50, she may listen to the news, she may listen to the Quran, she may listen to halal lectures, she may have halal meetings, and she may listen to something that is haram. This, to me, is best to give her the benefit of the doubt. If you advise her while giving her the headsets, that would be a disclaimer. So you say to her, I'm giving you the headset, but fear Allah, I am not in, uh, responsible for any sin that you commit with it. Then this is okay, it's a reminder. But if you don't know for certain what she's going to use it for, the default is it's okay to give it to her. Sanya says, how do we know the difference between shaitan's whispers and our own thoughts and nafs. This is almost impossible to differentiate because they work side by side. So you have to do your level best to seek refuge in Allah and avoid it to the best of your ability, insha'Allah. Uh, we have Tabish from Malaysia. Tabish? A Skype call from Tabish. Try to unmute your microphone if possible. Well, I think we've lost Tabish and I hope he tries again, inshallah. This Skype service is on trial basis, so maybe we would need a, a couple of more, more uh, or more trials to uh, fix it. Um, a sister says, am I sinful if I do not breastfeed my child without any valid reason? The answer is no. This was mentioned in the Quran. When there's a dispute between a wife and her husband over suckling, if she doesn't want to suckle her own child, then they will get someone else to do that. So there's nothing wrong for a woman to refuse suckling her own child, which is very rare because this is human nature. But we don't know people's circumstances and this might be a, a valid for some, but there is no sin even if she does not suckle her child for any good reason. There's no sin on her, inshallah. Um Maryam says, on what price should we calculate the zakat on our gold? On the buying price or on the selling price? After having the gold for a whole lunar year, if you were to dispose of it, would you sell it for the price you bought it a year ago or for the current price? The answer is for the current price. Therefore, your zakat is calculated upon the selling price of today. So you go to the jeweler's shop and say, this is 100 grams of 24 karat gold. How much will I get if I were to sell it? He said, X amount of money. You give 2.5% of that X amount of money. Ahmed says, how does one pay back the amount of money if stolen from a person long ago and now the person is dead. 
The property that you had stolen can never be yours for eternity. So you have to return it back to its lawful owner. If the person is dead, then this property or money belong, belongs to his heirs, those who inherited his wealth. So you have to look for them and give it to them. You can easily claim that you borrowed this money from him and you did not have the chance to return it. Now, alhamdulillah, you've gathered it and you earned it. So now you're returning it back to them so that they would distribute it to his heirs, his children, wife, mother, father, whatever. Zainab says, is it permissible for women to wear anklets? The answer is, this is permissible. And it is not only permissible, it is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah An-Nur, where Allah tells women not to strike the ground with their feet so that the sound of the anklets would not draw attention of men. This defies the hijab. Imagine the beauty of hijab. Allah Azza wa prohibited women from striking the ground with their feet when they're walking. They hit it a little bit stronger so that it would make a sound. And this sound would reach the ears of men and they would know that this is the sound of an anklet. Just the bare sound would lure them and tempt them, even if they don't know whether this woman who's walking with this anklet is an elephant or a gazelle. Still, shaitan works like this. So Allah prohibited them from making a sound with it in order not to tempt men. So the norm is, if you are at home, among your mahram, with your brothers and father, with your husband and children, there's no problem at all in wearing it. If you're going out, if it makes a sound, you have to take it off. If it doesn't make a sound, but it looks nice, you have to cover your foot by default and not expose it and show it to the people and Allah Azza wa knows best. A sister says, my query is regarding qada, oh, is regarding debt or a loan, qarz. On a deceased person, if a person dies and he has debts on him, and after selling all his assets, the debt is still not paid fully. Also, the family cannot afford to pay it. What is the ruling about it? There's no ruling about it. The children of the deceased are not obliged to pay his debts. So if I die and someone had lent me money, he comes to collect the money before we distribute my wealth to the heirs. So the first thing to do is to clear off my debts. Of course, after preparing the body and shrouding it and burying it. So the first thing, after that is to clear off my debts. And if they sell my assets, my properties, my house, my car, my uh, bank account, and it's not sufficient to complete paying off my debt, then this is it. The children, the wife, the brothers, they're not obliged to pay off my debt. And he cannot come and sue them or ask them to give him from their own earnings. He has no right to do that. I will be held questionable on the day of judgment. If I took the debt or the loan for a legitimate reason with the intention to paying it off, but I died before doing that, Allah will pay it off for me. If the children want of their own good self to pay it off, this is nice, this is Okay, but it's not mandatory. Yusra says, I have a friend who posts their own pictures on social media. 
When I like their pictures, am I also sinning with them? And should, I, should all these friends be unfollowed on social media because they post their pictures? And what advice can I give them to not post? First of all, liking their posts, which includes not wearing hijab or their pictures, etc., haram things, definitely is sinful. This is endorsing it. And you should unfollow such friends because they're bad news. If someone, Yusra, came to propose to you, the first thing they would do is check your social media. And they would check who you follow on Instagram. And if they fi find that you follow only trash, not practicing Muslims, but literally trash, then you are not worthy of being married to because you must have the same corrupt mentality. This is usual. So you have to advise them, and if they don't listen, just leave them. Finally, Anan says, most of the scholars say that the particular hadith is authentic and another is unauthentic. Would like to ask, what is the criterion that makes the hadith authentic or unauthentic? This is like asking a doctor, a neurosurgeon, how is he going to operate on a patient and what are the procedures he's going to follow? A layman like me and you can't understand this. You may not be able to understand how a neurosurgeon work and a neurosurgeon may not understand how you as a professional mechanic work on a car engine. So each one has his expertise his knowledge, and this is his bread and butter. So you cannot understand this unless you study from scratch the science of mustalah al-hadith and then go and study uh, uh, the different types of men, ilm al-rijal, al-jarh wa ta'deel, and all of these things that require lots of books, lots of time, and tutoring. You need a tutor to come and direct you how to walk and uh, uh, move between these uh, uh, mazes that you will find to understand such a huge and beautiful science. This is all the time we have until we meet tomorrow, same time. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.